Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you all with us. This country outlawed the transatlantic slave trade in 1808, but in 1860, the last slave ship set sail for the United States from what is now Benin. The name of the ship was the Clotilda. The story began when a slave owner and trader and shipbuilder, Timothy Meher, wagered thousands of dollars in a bet that he could smuggle enslaved Africans on his fast schooner, the Clotilda, into Alabama and not get caught. Those mostly Dahomean young people were stuffed in that schooner, sold, and the schooner was scuttled so the enslaver could go undetected and still win his bet. The Alabama Historical Commission announced the ship was recently discovered by a maritime archaeologist buried deep in the mud. This discovery has major significance for understanding our history, the history of slavery, and for the descendants of those enslaved on that schooner, who after the Civil War founded the community of Africatown in Alabama, where many live to this day. We're joined today by Dr. Sylviane Diouf, who is visiting professor at Brown University's Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and a member of the Scientific Committee of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience Project that's in Gory Island in Senegal, and author of Dreams of Africa in Alabama, the slave ship Clotilda, and the story of the last Africans brought to America. And Dr. Sylviane Diouf, welcome to Real News. It is a true pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about it. So talk, what, what, talk about the significance of this, of this discovery, uh, what it means, and why. It, I, I guess you can say it also from the perspective. I mean, you wrote the book before all this took place, obviously. So, so talk a bit about why this is so significant. Well, really, it's the first ship, the first slave ship that has been found, which came directly from Africa with people on board. I discovered several uh, years ago in Florida. Uh, actually was on the last leg from Jamaica to England. So besides that, besides, you know, we don't have any slave ship, you know, any wreck of a slave ship that has been found except in uh, South Africa. Mm. And um, so it's really totally unique. It's exceptional. This is the first time, you know, that we have a ship that, uh, that actually, you know, transported um, Africans and what we will see there, what we will we, we find, I don't, we find, I don't know. But uh, still, you know, in the entirety of the transatlantic slave trade to the Americas, this is the first time. So I know I, I only discovered this whole story because when I read Zora Neale Hurston's book, uh, Barakun, the, the story of the last slave, uh, Kujo Lewis, um, that, that, that I discovered this whole, what the story was about. But this discovery, it seems to me, um, from what I've, I've read, is that it, it unleashes, it opens up so many things, because this is one of the ships where you have, where you have uh, testimony from the people who own the ship or were on the ship. We had testimony from people who had been enslaved on that ship. I mean, and this, this, is, this is, that's why it makes it so powerful and unique that I think that we have finally found the ship itself. You know, to me, the discovery of the ship is extraordinary. Um, and again, I don't know what it will reveal. I don't know what it will bring to the story. But the thing really to me, maybe it's because I wrote the book, but it's really the story, which is, you know, which is exceptional in and of itself. So the, the story without the ship still, you know, stands for itself. Yes. If we had only the ship, then, you know, we would learn a little bit. But here we have this, this exceptional um, uh, occurrence that we have the ship and we have the entire story. And the story of Kudjo, as, you know, um, uh, as we find in, in Barakun, is only part of the story. You know, there's a story, there's a story of the other people who have on, on, on the slave ship, there's the, the story of before, um, they were on the ship, there's a story of after, the story on their enslavement, or their freedom. So it's a very, very large story. And, you know, when I was writing the book, uh, I was able to, you know, to find documentation that had never been seen, exploited, you know, found. And what I can say, and, you know, I've, I've written a lot uh, on the transatlantic slave trade, on slavery, uh, but this is the best documented story of the entire slave trade um, to the Americas. So we have a complete story now with 
what you know what we can say about you know the entire story, but we also have a ship, and whatever it will reveal, you know that's really added to the entire uh, episode. So I, I'd like to. There was a there was a quote in one of the articles that I read from. Um, Frederick Hibbert, who is an archaeologist and residence at National Geographic Society, and he wrote, he said that the discovery of the Clotilde sheds new light on the lost chapter of American history. The finding is also critical, a critical piece of the story of Africatown, which was built by the resilient descendants of America's last slave ship. So talk a bit about the story that you wrote and why it's so significant. I mean, what drew you to it? Well, first of all, when I, you know, when I started, uh, there are you know, it was said that it never happened, that it was just a big hoax. And uh, I thought, no, I, I'm pretty sure it did happen. And, um, the, you know, the first thing was that I, that I read was uh, a historic sketches of the, of the South, which was written by a white woman in Mobile, who knew uh, the last survivors, interviewed them, photographed them, um, sketched them, and uh, that was in, in 1912, her book was published in 1914. And from there, you know, I went to, you know, on and on and on to do research and to, to find more and more and more. And really, I mean, it was, um, it was an extraordinary story because, uh, you know, with what she wrote, what also, um, with also the interview of Kudrow, but if, the, the, the Zora Neale Stone interview, which is really very important, but it's not the only one. There, there were other interviews of Kudrow and of other people as well. And so with that, I was able to get a sense and recreate some of their lives before um, uh, the Clotilda, and then, of course, during slavery and after. And uh, it's, it's a very, very rich story extremely rich and um you know that that goes on you know from the 19 the um, 1840s you know where some some of them were born until the 1930s when the last survivors mm. are so the, 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 so the people who were enslaved on that ship some of them were bought as early as in the 1840s they were already enslaved in africa no, no. No, 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 no. They were some of them were born. And oh, oh, God. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Got gotcha. you. Right. Yeah. Just being clear. I just my misunderstanding. Sorry. So, so, and so, we'll talk a bit about why this is significant now. I mean, what what is it about this discovery that speaks to us here in the 21st century? Well, I think that you know, for a lot of people, slavery and and the slave trade are kind of ancient history. Yeah. And uh, you know, they don't. You know, there's, they don't see the, you know, the link with today. Um, even a book is, you know, it's a book. But now, you know, with a ship, which is something that people can actually see, can, um, you know, all the imagination, you know, that that people can have. Well, okay, so this is this is real. This is tangible. And um, I think that's why you know there is this excitement that uh, that we don't find when actually a book is published. So the idea that okay, so this is a slave ship. There were people on that ship. When when people you know think of the Middle Passage, they don't you know they think they know, but in many cases they don't. And so this discovery will actually help propel not only this particular story of the Clotilda, but hopefully will give people um, an interest in looking at other stories as well. Yeah, I was fascinated to, to, to read this one quote um, uh, from, from one of the descendants uh, of the, a, a woman named Lorna Woods who said, if they can find evidence of that ship, it's going to be big. All Mama told us would be validated. It would it would be it would do us a world of good. I mean, and I think people don't understand the significance of Africa Town and what that means. Who these people are, you know, that the, the tradition some of them have kept alive for all this time, um, and I think that's a significant piece of the story that that many people don't even know about. Um, it was interesting. I was in, when I was in Cuba last. Uh, I was with some Dahomean people, descended from Dahomean people, 
uh, who still have a very tight community outside of Havana. And um, they, they, they knew the story. So, you know, it, it, it carried on. So, I mean, I mean, so, so talk about the significance of Africatown and how that plays into all of this. Well, what is fascinating, you know, in this whole story is that the people, that they were not all from Benin, some were yes, from right. Nigeria, some were Yoruba, some were Dendi, some were Nupe, um, some were Muslims. Um, so it's the story really, what is fascinating is that once they were free in 1965, what they wanted to do was actually to return home. That was really their dream, and one of them said, I go back to Africa every night in my dreams, which gave you know, the title to my book. So their first effort was to actually try to go back, because you know they had families, they had land, they had, you know, um, they just wanted to go back home. Mm -hmm. And they tried, and they did not succeed. So the second thing they did was to ask Timothy Neher, who had actually brought them there, you know, to give them reparations, if you will. They told him that, you know, you brought us here, we had land, we had houses, we had families, we worked for you for five years for free, now, now we want to go home. We, we cannot, but we want you to give us land. And so the idea was for them to recreate, as they said, Africa where they were. He refused. And so they, they, they worked and saved their money, and they actually bought the land. And they, and they created this community, this little, uh, this little village that they called African Town, not Africa Town. Uh -huh. Afri African Afri Town. And in the 60s. But they called it African Town, which shows who they were, where they wanted to be, and what they tried to, to recreate. Talk a bit, just as we conclude, Dr. Duf, just what you think the long-term effect of this discovery, the long-term understanding of what this means. Because I think that, you know, if, if we don't kind of address our past and understand how it defines the present, then we'll never get through the future. And I think that's, this is, that's why, to me, reading about this was so compelling. So talk a bit about your thoughts on that. Yes, and I think, you know, that also one of the things that, uh, that I do is actually to look at the experience of people who were born in Africa, because it's kind of different from the experience of people who were born here, you know, when we're talking about this. So this, I think, will give a, a good understanding, you know, um, of the experience of people who are victims of the slave trade, um, and who they were, and what they did, and what they wanted to do, because I think they are, the people of African Sun are very representative of all the Africans. You know, the 12 and a half million were uh, put on, uh, on board boats and 10.7 million arrived. But what were their dreams? What, they, what did they want, you know, and how they, how they lived their enslavement, you know, their separation from, from their families and their, and, you know, and their homes and their communities. And I think that gives you know, a good understanding, a good window uh, on their experience. And also then on the, you know, on the experience of the people who were also uh, were enslaved, uh, who were born here because, you know, they had relations with them, they, you know, some of them married, etc. And one other thing which is important also is this, this transition from enslavement back to freedom. And when I say freedom, I would say freedom because, you know, it was not real free freedom. Right, right. But, you know, with, with the fact that they arrived late and, you know, they lived uh, up to some of them uh, um, during the Depression, you have really a whole arc, you know, from West Africa to slavery, to freedom, to Jim Crow. And uh, this, is, this is the only story that we have. And it's an extraordinary story of extraordinary people. It certainly is. And this, is, this is, a, a, been a wonderful conversation. I deeply appreciate you taking time, Dr. Sylvia Andrew, for being with us here today on The Real News. And thank you for your work. Thank you. And I'm Mark Stani here for The Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. Take care.